Let's get started. Good evening, dear colleagues. Let's start our session, Blockchain Works for Business. That's the title, and today we have got an impressive panel. And I'd like to start with the words of introduction. Let me introduce to you our panelists. Denis has joined us. Denis Dodon, Director of Center for Innovations, Research and Development Alpha Bank. And today when we're going to discuss the application of blockchain as some specific business cases, Denis will tell us how blockchain helps in the trade finance. Parvis Tuhtasunov, Director of the Federal Cadastral Chamber of the Russian Registry. Parvis will tell us about the electronic mortgage and uh, collaterals. Sahib Hassanov, head of FinTech Division, Central Bank of the Republic of Azerbaijan. He will tell us about uh, decentralized identification. Yuri Dubin, Managing Director, head of custody service, Sberbank. And he will tell us um, how decentralized um, custody service may look like. Clive Cook, Managing Director, R3 Consortium. He will tell us in every detail which cases, which business cases have been achieved uh, at Corda platform and what added value it creates for business. Also, Nikolai Mukhanov, Chief Technology Officer S7, will tell us how blockchain is used in the aviation. Eddie Stanin, Chairman of the Executive Board National Settlement Depository. I think that uh, he will speak about uh, tokenization in blockchain. Colleagues, blockchain, I think, is no longer a buzzword. And actually, it was a buzzword during the cryptocurrencies boom. And now we see the interest of investors to that technology remains. The investments uh, into blockchain technologies double every year. And there are new and new cases emerging. We see that we see new competences, meaning that there are new resources, new specialists in blockchain emerge. The regulators from more than 40 countries are doing lots of testing, lots of experiments, lots of pilot projects. It means that the technology after it is no longer a hype technology, now is um, helping the business to evolve. So this is uh, the best time for us because uh, actually we, without any anxiety, may try to understand how it may help us in our business. There are lots of pilot projects, lot of tests and experiments, but at the moment, actually, we don't have any industrial application of blockchain. From the standpoint of technology, we don't have any serious questions because the technology evolves very actively. There are more than 20 different technological platforms being set up. Top three platforms, this is about Ethereum, Hyperledger, and Corda, which are used in most cases. But in my opinion, in order to promote that technology and to, to move forward to, and to move in the direction of the industrial application, we have to take a comprehensive approach to that question. So there are certain technologies. These technologies are quite mature, although they evolve. But there are three important aspects. First of all, this is a question of cybersecurity. Decentralized to register, um, and it is very transparent, uh, and it introduces a new type of interaction between the stakeholders 
and helps to avoid the gray market and um, fraudulent activities, but still the question of uh, the cybersecurity remains there. Governance model is quite uh, important, how we determine the roles of interaction between the stakeholders, how the risks and uh, responsibilities are shared or distributed. And uh, last but not least, this is about the use of uh, this technology in business cases. What questions can be addressed by means of these technologies? And very often, despite the fact that uh, blockchain is uh, not a buzzword any longer, but still uh, all the processes can be called a blockchain technology. And there is a temptation to find a kind of uh, silver bullet which will actually save us from everything. We have to be quite cautious. We have to find the processes and the problems which can be solved by blockchain technologies much more efficient than other technologies. And saying that, I'd like to comment on the news from yesterday. Let me share that once again with you, really. I think uh, Hallmark event took place yesterday. Master Chain Platform got uh, Federal Security Bureau certificate and approvals. That means that this platform is ready for the industrial application. And at the moment, uh, apart from the cybersecurity issues, are the questions have been discussed such as uh, distribution of risks, distribution of responsibilities, uh, the interaction within the distributed depository system was also discussed. I think that in the market we have the very first platform which can really be used uh, for the financial services market. And saying that, I suggest that uh, with these words of introduction, let's discuss how blockchain may be brought into real life. How can we start using that for business? And uh, let me pass the floor to start with the following question. In 2017, when Master Chain was only in its infancy, Marco Polo case was already there in the market. And I think that this is is one of the most mature cases. This is the case which was developed within our three consortia based on Corde platform, Alpha Bank. Joined that case and a question to Dennis. Dennis Dodon. What's the status of that project at the moment? What are the expectations uh, regarding that project? Probably you can post certain results. Have you cut costs or you cut the time of transaction? What blockchain gives to the business? And uh, this is what I'm going to discuss with the speakers, actually. We are not going to some technical details. Uh, let's speak about the business. What uh, blockchain may give to the business? Any advantages? Dennis? Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you so much, Tatiana, for this question. This is sir, a philosophical and economic and a technical question at the same time. Let me say a few words about the platform afterwards. I will proceed to the business. And we have Clive um, Cook, who will tell us in more detail about the platform. Let me tell you about uh, Marco Polo as a platform. And uh, Clive will speak more about um, Corde. Marco Polo case actually has been developed for many years already. And the key component uh, of its motivation is to optimize the workflow between the corporations, between the banks, and between all the adjacent stakeholders, such as logistics companies, uh, insuring, insurance companies, and other stakeholders, which may somehow contribute to the flows of commodities and products and goods. This case actually is uh, to be issued out of the banking instruments and facilities. You may find a payment commitment there. So this is uh, something between the letter of credit and uh, um, the payment and uh, 
We have tested that with uh, NLMK. We did a pilot project on that platform. Uh, supply between uh, NLMK and a uh, German supplier was uh, um, scrutinized when an invoice was issued. And in essence, a commitment was um, required to, to guarantee the payment, and this commitment in its current version can be uh, discounted somehow. This is back to the question why we need blockchain and how this platform and the technology itself is applicable to the business. We say that uh, during the trade financing, and this is um, pertinent not only to Marco Polo, but also to other banking guarantees, uh, there is a uh, lack in terms of uh, agreement in actions between the seller and the purchaser or the buyer. So a unified environment uh, could be uh, could be very handy. Different applications, business applications, um, Master Chain and uh, Marco Polo, which provide for banking guarantees and uh, which use decentralized environment, bringing together the stakeholders into one ecosystem. They create a lot of added value because, in essence, you have for an application, and the banks has uh, bank has such an application. And when you enter the application with certain role, you will exchange the status. You would get a product. And the main problem there, the one which I see there, which still exists there and is not solved yet is how the bank may add the product to that application because actually banks usually operate within a centralized environment and now actually you can pass everything over to the decentralized environment to Marco Polo and Master Chain as platforms they show that there is a demand for these services that uh, it may bring a lot of business fruits answering question what value it may add it is very valuable in terms of uh, reducing the uh, time to manage these products and become the the the, the processes um, actually go on much faster when you exchange data uh, quickly actually all the actions related to that data can be taken much faster as well and this becomes obvious and when talking to the clients uh, within Russia and uh, abroad, when we look at the banking guarantees, when we look at whether the market is ready for that, the biggest problem lies in the area of uh, infrastructure. Governance can be discussed how it's all governed, how you may uh, govern and steer the decentralized environment. But anyway, my opinion is that the technological decentralization equals a legal decentralization this way or that way. It can be one single legal entity or a group of um, entities, for instance, compared to Marco Polo. In fact, uh, there is a trade IX uh, uh, as operator and there is a banking community which creates the product, creates the platform, and I do think that uh, by means of voting, will uh, somehow manage this platform. Probably Master Chain will use a similar structure because uh, there is a very good experience which could be replicated. And uh, technological centralization may at the same time decentralization may translate into a centralized uh, governing or managing of the solution. So in brief, that would be it. Thank you so much, Dennis. And uh, saying that, I would like to pass it over to Clive. I have the following question to you. Corda platform creates cases and consults and works in different jurisdictions. At the same time, the standards and requirements to cybersecurity are different in um, different countries. Many of the requirements to use uh, cryptography standards. The regulator, in terms of cryptography, that's the FSB, the Federal 
Security Bureau. And when we did certification for Master Chain, we had developed uh, the methodology of the assessment along with Master Pro. So in the other states, actually, the situation is different. The stakeholders, uh, they assume the responsibility for the cybersecurity. So speaking as a platform which is approaching different jurisdictions with different rules, what is your approach to localization of the platform solutions in every country? What are, what are the requirements of the stakeholders? Do you take stock of them and do you adapt your platform for the needs of certain countries? Um, that's a very interesting question. And I think one of the things that we, we need to really consider is taking a step backwards with Corda. Corda was not built in a room by a bunch of engineers with the hope that it would meet the requirements of the marketplace that it was being built for. Corda originally was formed by an architecture working group. And the architecture working group was made up of regulated entities, banks who are used to dealing in this environment, whose input from the very beginning, not just with regard to the functionality, but of course the regulatory requirements that, 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 a, that a, a platform such as Corda would be made to adhere to. So I think it's very important that we, we assess that, that uh, Corda was not a derivative of something else. It wasn't built for cryptocurrencies. It wasn't built to disintermediate banks. It wasn't built to be uh, an, an anachronistic uh, 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 product that, that would change the way that payments were made. This was designed by a group of banks who knew that they would be using it. And that's what makes Corda so much different from Ethereum and from other platforms. This has been put together by people that knew they were going to be using it. Thank you so much. So from the very outset, so you adapted that for some specific cases and for some specific stakeholders for the banks. And you actually had to comply with certain regulations. They consult some embraces more than 300 stakeholders. How, what about the decision making? How it takes place? Can the stakeholders um, uh, influence the pricing or a tariff? And are there different conditions for the stakeholders from different countries? The application, so, so Corda itself is like the iOS on your phone. The actual um, Corda platform runs and various applications are designed and built and sit on top of Corda. Now, those applications are not built by R3. R3 do not make any applications at all. These are all designed and will compete with one another, whether it's in the world of KYC, insurance, uh, trade finance, it doesn't matter. These individual applications are built elsewhere. We assist, of course, because we have this huge network of what used to be banks, but is now banks, insurers, uh, increasingly corporates, especially in the supply chain, supply chain world of uh, car manufacturing. And it's these application builders themselves uh, and interestingly enough, the, the most successful applications that would appear to, that are going into production over the next, not, not few years, not, not few months, but then in the next few weeks by the end of this year, they too, like Corda, have all been built with the assistance of the users. So we've talked about Marco Polo, but again, in, in the letters of credit space, uh, there is a, a, a product that is close to going into production called Voltron. Voltron has been driven by HSBC, which is one of the largest letters of credit um, dealers in the world. So I think this is just t 
to, to, to try and give you the sort of feeling that these things aren't being built in isolation. And of course, just because the users are supporting it doesn't necessarily guarantee its success. But from a governance point of view, going back to your question, you would expect that the users themselves, if they're involved in the process of building this, these applications, will give their opinion as to uh, the, the functionality, how these things should work, and of course, how they should be priced, which, is, which goes to the, to the essence of your question. And of course, some of these applications may be, um, may be priced uh, differently. They, they may encourage, um, in, in the case of Marco Polo, Marco Polo doesn't distinguish between a huge car manufacturer uh, that's producing um, tens of thousands of, of uh, documents during the course of a year and invoices to a small supplier that sends Daimler or BMW one, one invoice uh, a month. So it doesn't distinguish between, of course, the pricing will reflect the, the general usage. So do I understand correctly that we have a mini community around specific case and eventually it takes part in fun uh, functional requirements and also expresses a view about the price or does it take uh, part in decision making as well? Well, I wouldn't say that they, that they take part in the decision making mm -hmm. because these R3 is a commercial entity. Mm -hmm. it's, it, although it has bank shareholders, the banks are minority. That the, no one bank has anywhere near as as many shares in the company as the as the staff and the founders. So it, it, we don't have committee meetings where we decide what will the price be of of, of, a, of an application. How will we price various services? We're a completely uh, 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 commercial entity, as is Trade IX that build Marco Polo, and as is Voltron. Voltron started out as a consortium of banks working together. The problem with having a consortium of banks that are working together, no disrespect to banks, but nothing gets done. You need a commercial uh, party at the table who drives the business, who makes decisions and gets things done. And that's where I think we m draw the distinction between what I would call a consortium and what I would call consultation, which are two different things. Thank you very much, Clive. I would like to come back to Dennis, and the question is the following. In particular, in trade financing, one of the tools, uh, psychological tools and mechanisms which allows to decrease cost and time is the use of smart contracts. And on the other hand, the use of smart contracts is possible only when we talk about definite standard documents. And the question is about standardization of documents standardization of data, and I think it's one of the key ones. And you have taken part in several projects, and now we were discussing Marco Polo, and we were also scrutinizing other projects as well. Could you please share international experience if you have faced it, if you have witnessed it? What happens to standardization? <coughs> Well, basically, it's a very complicated question from the standpoint of its current status, I mean, how it is implemented. R3, and not R3, but uh, banks, a group of banks which are working around CODA, they are uh, looking at universal trade network creation, and uh, they will create those standards uh, for ICC. And I think the majority of documents which could be standardized are in closed type databases. There is nothing to take them from except for Bolero and Texas Docs, uh, which can uh, have documents according to 
international bill of lading, and it can be done also in some cases with the use of invoices, so they are quite standard ones. But all other documents which are connected with trade financing, they are currently in a non-digital uh, state. And when it is non-digital, it's difficult to standardize something. And what it is done currently in the market, several steps are made in terms of rules of work with uh, specific consortiums, how to define uh, real games, what are the product committees, what is the go who uh, who's the governing body, what are standard documents about how protocol is to work and to operate. And from what I see, we don't have any devised or elaborated classical approach. There are different initiatives, but it is also about having a lot of players in the market and you can't make everyone do uh, or act in the same manner. So we need to find a way to harmonize uh, all the activities and maybe some national practices can give impetus for the creation of an international standard. Let's have a look at master chain AFT, how it is done in Russia, for instance, uh, the example how it is done here. In fact, what you have done now within the framework of issuing this certified platform is a kind of a collective labor which was done by a group of banks from the standpoint of platform division. And at the same time, a huge amount of administrative work was on master chain because it is the body which acts as a voice of the market and banks in terms of the overall regulation process in the field. And rules will be formed in this connection. And the approach, which is created right now can be the role model for some international markets. And I think that in the same way, uh, in the same manner, you can adopt practices from other countries and who are communicated with Valtron, Utrade, Marco Polo, Congo, and who have looked at different uh, trade financing platforms, which have network, which have platform, no matter uh, which it is. Hyperledger, Corda, or others, and they have business rules inside them. But anyway, it will be, it will stay in the status of a rule, but not a law. Something uh, similar to UCP uh, 600 or Ecoterm, which is a kind of an open adopted business law where parties have come to an agreement and they also use that in courts in financial courts. And I think that those decisions will involve some individual rules and maybe some international rules if they are to be devised. Because I think a trade network is one of the examples because uh, some interactions are tried to be standardized for Marco Polo of Altron. Thank you very much. Digital transformation trend is not only about blockchain, and we have been discussing uh, API, that's also about standardization issue. Uh, only in this case we can shift to digit and conduct this digital transformation and blockchain in this regard is no exception. And I would like to shift to a different topic. And recently there has been understanding in the market that blockchain wonderfully complies with the goal of tokenization of assets. And I would like to address this question to Yuri because Sberbank Depository uh, within the framework of the association was one of the initiators for the creation of a decentralized uh, depository system where we have e mortgage which is uh, is circuit, which is transferred inside of the system. So what does it give it uh, to you as for a depositor and what are the key factors of success in terms of industrial exploitation because it is ready for industrial use at the moment. So I think in order to understand what was uh, that about, I think we are to come back to 2016 when uh, e-registration for mortgages was introduced. It was quite successful. We saw a lot of mortgage loans registered in an e-format, but at the same time, after the mortgage is given and the mortgage is registered, 
uh, uh, there is a need to have pledge in an e-format as well to uh, launch the process, uh, mortgage process quickly and as the majority of uh, pawns and pledges exist in a paperwork till now and we can compare the volume of oh, damage we have the uh, security rate of 5% and it is different from other markets and I think the main driver, the main thing we would like to have as a result uh, as the participants of the mortgage market is e-pledge instrument, uh, is an e-pledge because I think it's a very powerful uh, incentive to have such an instrument and in 2018 other banks started to be actively involved in the development of the project for e-pledge instruments and currently we had standard approach to have an e-security and to have it allocated in a depository and after that uh, the procedure is a standard one but it turned out to be more complicated because each pledge is connected with security mission because each uh, of them has its own borrower or issuer and currently we work with a a high number of issuers for instance one million or so that's a great deal and I think the most important, uh, the most appropriate way for this market to launch quickly and to live, to survive is to give mortgage banks to interact with clients directly to quickly resolve all the issues and it means that registration of e-mortgages is to be decentralized. So the logic is the following. and. Afterwards, we started having a look at the following. We uh, are all used to living in a decentralized system, and it has a lot of advantages, speed, uh, the result of calculations, transparency of the market, that everyone sees everything. And we have an idea, we had an idea emerging that basically if we have these accounting system in a decentralized manner with the use of distributed ledger technology, then the issues of transparency, a result of calculations and speed will be resolved. And uh, the law was adopted in late 2017 and it describes the centralized uh, e-mortgages accounting and we were discussing that we wanted to have the system based on uh, distributed technolo ledger technology and it was not in contradiction with uh, the law. So blockchain and uh, uh, DLT are not mentioned there. And basically, if we talk about success factors, legislation is at least not to prevent, of, uh, prevent us uh, from doing something in a, in a decentralized system. And after that, we started to think, what happens next? How can we manage all that? Because we wouldn't like to uh, have it as a commercial project, because for the majority of stakeholders, for mortgage banks, uh, the value is clear. That's e-paper. And that is the, about the speed of calculation and e-mortgages and transparency uh, of those calculations and interactions. Uh, there is a need for consortium in some format as we tend to think right now. And we wanted to have that on the platform of our association. So I think our advantage here was unlike a trade financing case was that uh, we have just few mortgage banks, so these are just top 10 banks which account for 90 percent of uh, all mortgages. So we managed to fit in the system at all the banks, all the particip potential stakeholders who were involved, and the platform which uh, was used for negotiating and we have agreed upon all the accounting standards and accounting systems and uh, all the issues involved in this part was a fintech association. So that's the non-commercial platform which could have those rules set and followed. Thank you very much. So I know about that, but just for the audience, Yuri, could you just um, mention uh, relations based on the um, uh, agreements and negotiations. So I think from the standpoint of uh, 
uh, that aspect is very important to define uh, liabilities and field of liabilities and responsibilities of stake stakeholders between participants, operators, uh, which is uh, currently defined as FinTech Association. And uh, does it contradict our current legislation or is it backed up by legislation on the contrary? First, I would like to say that Tatiana has mentioned tokenization as the first part, and I haven't answered it till the, uh, completely. We have we have tokens as the part of our accounting system, but as we have a thesis that we are in compliance with current legislation and we are not introducing any amendments to legislation, then our system, thanks to smart contracts, is supporting the overall uh, order of depository accounting, which is uh, set by current regulation. Yes, we have tokenization, but after that we have smart contract launched and we have discussed how it is to work, and it is part of the system uh, regulations, and they are registered, they are logged. We have all the reports formed, which are necessary on all the levels, going from one depository to another, and the overall logics, which stipulates uh, current uh, regulation, is completely reiterated in the system and it is done with the use of smart contracts and hashed you can't it is just for the control of the regulator and in terms of uh, our relations uh, Denise was completely right when he said that decentralized st story uh, is the most appropriate one because on the IT level it is a decentralized one uh, the way it is done right now and we have those relations uh, when we have an operator fintech organization and all the participants are concluding same agreements with the association and uh, that's a huge agreement more than 100 pages and as a lot of things had to be stipulated I think that they will be amended further, but now it is done in the form of uh, joining uh, to the conditions of those contractual relations, and they have license requirements, certification, connection, support, monitoring of the system, security, incidents, management, and incidents investigation and also conditions of depository activities in terms of specific instruments which are used, I think that's, uh, that is something which can be used for having uh, separate agreements for all the participants of the system with their own clients, which will be bilateral ones. And within the framework of the system, we have core relations between uh, stakeholders, between depositories. Then again, we're talking about bilateral uh, relations. Thank you very much. Yuri, if we talk about the participants of this case, then we have Ross uh, Riester, authority besides for banks and uh, uh, and depositors. So, so Ross Reister, Russian Registry, is one of the authorities wo which was one of uh, the pilots in terms of testing blockchain technologies. And to what extent is it hard for state authority, for governmental authority, to implement innovations, such innovations as decentralized distributed register? Thank you very much. We haven't introduced distributed ledger at the moment because uh, that was in late 2016, uh, early 2017, but it was quite a hype and it was actively discussed. And the first idea we had coming to us uh, was the idea to have the overall system transferred on blockchain, and that was connected with the fact that uh, the name of our authority in the Russian language sounds similar to the technology of distributed ledger, and, and the system was 
quite elaborate, and they started to think also think also in 2016 of moving um, on to blockchain, but they haven't done that yet. And so I think even if they, together with their uh, financing opportunities, interest, haven't done that, what uh, would have been to us if we have? Uh, if we had decided to do that. So another case was of interest for us, which was implemented in the Leningrad region. Smart contracts as a pilot, pilot project. That's quite a simple story when we have security fund for shareholder construction shareholders and there are banks, there are construction companies, developing companies, and so they are to give us an answer that according to uh, this contract, there is a certain amount of money and the, there is a need to reserve them. After that, the fund provides a feedback and after that, we can register this construction uh, contract. And there were three constituent parts. There was a desire on behalf of state authority. There was financial support on behalf of uh, the bank. And we also had the platform which was ready. And in the Langrat region, it was quite quick and easy from the standpoint of implementation, and it was quite successful, but it wasn't developed further because we were changing the system of Russian registry operations, and as we were working with uh, our previous projects, we didn't manage to bring forward any amendments to that case, but we, will come, we can come back to that in the nearest future because it's about client protection, about transparency, about continuity, everything which is a characteristic of blockchain. And in terms of pilot projects within the framework of state authorities, there, is, there are no problems in this regard. There is a, a will of the head, luck and money because state is not able to spend money on pilot projects, so you have to have an anchor investor or to have a kind of a fund or developer. Uh, but once we decide that the pilot project is a success and this could be replicated or put into practice, this is where the problems arise. The main problem is about the powers. And let me touch upon the master chain case. I uh, can congratulate you on getting the uh, necessary permits and uh, uh, approval. Uh, I hope that uh, we will replicate that success. So in order to follow that project, and no one punishes us for that, as a public agency, we need a regulation, a regulation issued by the government of the Russian Federation to allow that experiment. So once we got the regulation, the necessary permit. We need licensed software. And um, at the moment, we have uh, the certificate, necessary certificate, and uh, other way, um, actually, hope that uh, you will not get that uh, permit, and uh, I will be the first one to obtain that. But very soon, we will obtain the regulation. So once, um, actually, our GIS system uh, moves to blockchain, we'll have to uh, deal with the uh, cybersecurity issues such as the simulation of threats, simulation of uh, risks, and it will take some time. In order to do that, you have to uh, to make a tender, and so therefore you have to ask for funding. And this is the main problem of the state paid uh, projects. After that, we have to understand who is going to finalize our GIS so it works, and who is going to maintain that in the working conditions. Uh, Yuri said that there is a big contract, and we all endorsed it, but we have not joined that project, and we have not joined that agreement, and we'll add more terms and conditions. And so 100 conditions will translate into 200 conditions. Only after that, we can get started, and we will see whether it works right or wrong. Back to the electronic collaterals or mortgages. We are working without master chain, and uh, there are thousands of uh, such uh, e-documents, but once we move to master chain, probably it would be secure, and it will relieve the burden put on our employees because uh, the more secure transactions we have, the easier it is because uh, we are still uh, 
optimizing our headcount, and uh, we have to work faster and quicker. Russia is among the top countries in terms of the speed uh, of uh, processing the applications, but everyone wants to speed it up. Actually, we managed to cut the time thanks to the faster accounting processes and uh, once we make step forward, actually, we'll raise the bar even higher. Thank you so much, Parvis. And saying that, I would like to move to our next speaker, Eddie Astanin. National, how do we call that? National. Sorry, National Settlement Depository, so not the Russian one. National Settlement Depository, or the Russian one, actually. And in essence, this is a central custody service or depository. How a central or settlement de depository is associated with the distributed register? What solutions uh, can uh, central depository offer for the distributed registry? How it can be used? Thank you so much for this, your question. We actually experimented a lot with blockchain since 2016, probably, and uh, following the results of our uh, experiments, uh, we issued uh, a white paper. You can use a QR code to download this document. There is no contradiction between these things, because when we speak about blockchain in uh, its industrial applications, still we are speaking about the permission blockchain. The blockchain, which also has a central manager or the operator, which uh, um, somehow makes sure that the rules are followed by all the stakeholders, by all the participants. I would say that this is a very consistent technology, even for centralized structures including the National Settlement Depository. Now that's why this technology can be used in the markets. And this is one of our uh, outputs uh, in the markets where technologies are not very mature, for instance. Uh, there are markets where these solutions are automated, are finalized, and a lot is invested into these solutions in order to improve their security and their capacity. So we don't see any threat for the traditional systems, for instance, for the natural settlement depository. But there are more opportunities for the blockchain to be used in the markets where the infrastructure is not very mature, is not developed, along with Ross Silco's bank. We have launched a pilot project on using blockchain f to tokenize or digitalize of the uh, custodian statements for grain by means of tokenization digitalization. We will bring together the physical storage of grain and uh, the financial markets where you can do some settlements, where you can actually sell this commodity. And we are rather optimistic about that pilot project because uh, if it proves to be a success, uh, we can uh, scale it up. Russia is one of the main grain exporters. This is a huge market, uh, counting for about 6 trillion rubles a year. There is also metal market, coal market, uh, timber and lumber markets, and uh, there, is, there are no contradictions. So more opportunities are there. Well, many panelists said that uh, distributed uh, technology doesn't mean that it would be decentralized uh, governance, and that's why the National Settlement Depository may act as uh, the centralized uh, governor. You spoke about the infrastructure and the distributed uh, uh, registry infrastructure. Uh, who has to invest into that? Who has to invest into that um, infrastructure? Do you need the support of the regulator? All this has to be supported by the market itself. In our practice, we are guided by the business cases. We are guided by the market needs. We invest into those solutions once they are needed. And uh, the second conclusion, which we realized uh, in the framework of our experiments, is that when we speak about the market, uh, 
which embraces uh, national investors, then it should be a con um, actually an atmosphere of trust and confidence. So this is about the legal ground, about the laws and regulations. That's why we are looking forward to, to uh, see the law on digital assets, because even if we operate tokens as a uh, an institution which subordinates to the central bank. We have to show how we take stock of that asset, um, um, how we do the booking, and how we do the taxation. And so these are dull and boring things, but without that, uh, this technology will not uh, be used uh, industrially. Investment should proceed from the business, but uh, legislation, this is what the regulator has to adopt. And we do hope that we will see more results there. You mean that still regulation has to set up a kind of a framework, uh, a comfort area for the market, and after that the market will invest into the infrastructure? Well, let me take advantage of your example of um, master chain, so the permits uh, for the stakeholders to actually invest into that, they have to realize that this is all legal, that this is endorsed and accepted. Actually, we are running out of time, and that's why, unfortunately, we'll have to move forward. Sahib, my question goes to you. Within master chain, we are using cryptography standard on the one hand, but at the same time, we have a whole procedure of identifying the stakeholders, and we have a fintech identification center, and uh, therefore every stakeholder has to be identified and uh, authorized. You have uh, a blockchain-based case uh, called KYC. Um, how does your identification system work, and uh, how do you provide for the consistency and openness of the system? Our, we launched our project last year. It was initiated by the Central Bank of Azerbaijan. Let me clarify the objectives of the project. This is not about KYC. The main objective is the digital identification of citizens. And in the framework of that project, we not only developed the digital identification system, but we also set up the platform to use that identification system in order to provide banking services online. How the identification of citizens uh, takes place, uh, actually, three levels of identification are there. And depending on that level, the physical persons and legal entities may get certain services. The first level of identification is based on a unique code uh, pertinent to every person and the phone number uh, which um, he or she uh, holds. And uh, we use special service in order to confirm that uh, this uh, phone number belongs to him and therefore a person gets an access to the system. And uh, for instance, uh, he or she may uh, open uh, a banking account uh, limited to $300 a year, and no digital signatures are needed uh, to this end. The second level of identification implies that uh, a video call would be made uh, by the operator, uh, and uh, after this uh, video conference, uh, the physical entity may open a banking account uh, with the average limit of about $4,000 a year. And the third level of of identification implies that there will be a video phone call and uh, an uh, authorized signature. In that case, uh, individual or self-employed people are physical persons and uh, uh, legal entities will open up uh, banking accounts with an extended limit. We are using international standards. And uh, this is end-to-end -end, uh, cryptography between the banks, clerks, and uh, the clients. And we also comply with the private data safety and security. In compliance with that law, we have to use a digital signature, mandatory. But this creates uh, lots of inconveniences for the users, and therefore we're working with other public agencies in order to simplify these processes. 
um, just like you are trying to uh, simplify the process of getting an uh, uh, consent from the client. Okay, I understand that the project uh, is at the prototyping stage, right? Well, the project is at the development stage. We have prepared the functionality for the physical persons, for the natural persons, and uh, helping off accounts, uh, making deposits, and um, uh, we are also working on uh, the functionality for uh, the legal entities, and uh, we will finalize that project uh, by the end of that year. And it's um, early next year, we'll launch that system, and I invite you to attend the inauguration of the system. That's it. Thank you so much. We will make sure to come. I have one more question to you. I understand that this is one of the biggest infrastructural questions, actually. I have two questions. The first one, as far as we are speaking about Russia, uh, FinTech Association has a separate uh, direction for the development of uh, the distributed registries. And uh, we try to build a kind of a development strategy which embraces the technological solutions. What the Bank of Azerbaijan does in terms of determining the role of the central banks, how are you going to govern the blockchain-based solutions and distributed registries? What will you do as the regulator? And the second question, do you plan, because as far as I understand, the main developer which was awarded the bidding, the contract, uh, and that's the IBM. What risks do you see there? Do you plan to make your own solution, or there are no risks there? As for the development of the technology in general, and the development uh, of the market in general, fintech in Azerbaijan, right now is only in its infancy. Our project is the very first blockchain-based one in Azerbaijan. And uh, our bosses uh, instructed us to develop a transformation plan, which would include the financial projects and uh, the projects uh, in the areas uh, auxiliary to the financial markets. So this would be a three-year-long plan. We are negotiating with other public agencies, Ministry of Taxation, Customs Authority, and similar custom uh, other public agencies which are close to the financial sector. We suggest that we could launch other pilot projects based on blockchain, and probably they would be interested in that. Back to your second question, whether we are dependent on the technological giants. In essence, we don't have much money for our own development, but um, when we launched the tender, actually, we opted for the open, a, uh, open source uh, solution so that uh, at the end of the day we could develop our own solutions to be quite independent. So in future, you plan to use outsource solutions, just like MasterChain did. We actually used the open source Ethereum in order to develop our own solution. Thank you so much. And saying that, I'd like to proceed to the topic of settlements on blockchain. Today, we spoke about digital financial assets and tokenization, and we're looking forward to uh, this new law on the financial assets and uh, digital assets. So we spoke about blockchain in the foreign trade relations. We spoke about identification and probably we also can speak about the settlements on blockchain. And uh, my question goes to Nikolai Mukanov because as Seven Tech Lab has implemented a business case uh, on selling tickets using blockchain technology. What's the status of your project? And I'll have one more question to you. What about the governance model, the new stakeholders, for instance, other companies? Can they join your solution? Thank you so much, Tatiana. Good afternoon. 
first and foremost, uh, I will not speak about the status. Uh, actually, we launched this project for two stakeholders, but this is for two years that we're working in the production and at the moment. Our monthly turnover is about $1 million. How many stakeholders do you have there? There are two stakeholders, but it means that we are working for quite a while and we are profit making. Uh, the payment case which we have implemented, this is one of uh, several functions which gives you a competitive advantage. This new approach to the mutual settlements, we actually decrease the costs for the new agents and therefore we offer this potential for uh, numerous stakeholders. Actually, this project is operated by Tech Lab. And uh, we have uh, set up that platform and the rules, which enabled us, us to enter the case. And now we are on the threshold of um, large scaling, so to say. And can I challenge you a little bit? Uh, because uh, we have discussed it in details and I have a question, why do I need blockchain here? Uh, because basically we could use um, open API, that's one of our favorite topics because we are talking about application here, that's the first point. And the second question I would like to reiterate that we have two participants in the industrial field, but for instance if we have a new participant who wants to get connected, how does he do that? Are there any clear rules of getting connected? I will start with the last question. One of the important points is the creation of a legal framework because it is to provide for the legal nature of the process and transparency of all the stakeholders. And blockchain is technical implementation of this uh, operation. So we have the rules there defined together with Alpha Bank, as I have said, we are ready to extend. And why do we need blockchain here? Uh, that uh, was, uh, we have given answer many times in the run of the recent two years, smart, uh, days. Smart contracts uh, provide clear-cut rules for us which are, can't be provisioned uh, in different manner because they provide for the execution of these rules uh, amongst uh, all the stakeholders. If we have a look at the informatization, digitalization story, which is actively developing at the moment, then we can see that in the run of recent 30 years, the use of computers and e-computing in companies has made a long way, starting with a printing machine, um, ending up with complete automation of all business processes. And here there is a very important point. Without blockchain, that automation ended uh, up on the perimeter, on the board of campaign, because you couldn't have several companies taken and agree upon joint uh, rules of the game for everyone. But with the use of blockchain and smart contracts, we can create transparent and clear rules for all the participants of business process. They are visible, they are, remain unchanged, and no one can change them without uh, consent of all the participants. And that's a very impo important point, and blockchain gives such an opportunity. Thank you. And one of the important trends in the development of technologies is mm, co-competition when we have interaction of different participants of the market. And so I think blockchain in such framework is connected with some mistrust between mistrust between among competitors but still there is a need for interaction so here blockchain provides a helping hand i do agree with that do you want to add something dennis yes i would like to add what nikolai has said because the question why do we need blockchain between two participants two stakeholders and quite often why do we need it and this question is raised all the time and I can say one thing for sure from what I see, from which kind of value it gives us. For instance, the process of tariff setting as any other process which is scrutinized within the framework of uh, interaction gives us an opportunity to create it in your own environment internally or you can set the rules uh, upon which you have agreed with all the participants and define it on the level of smart contract. The pra practice has shown also in our example in this case that programming uh, solutions 
from outside is much simple than to much simpler than to change internal infrastructure but of course uh, infrastructure is to be ready for that and in spite of the fact that we have two participants here we have a seven and alpha bank we have, in this case, a lot of agents which are conducting those calculations and they are buying those tickets, that's B2B interaction, and adding up um, each new agent is possible only when all parties have uh, harmonized that, that we have the new member which has a right to conduct some activities and it is done with the consent of both parties. So we had cases when we do did something um, not simultaneously, maybe a seven brought forward a new participant, but the new participant couldn't start working without the consent of the second party, without the consent that, yes, it can uh, operate. So the decisions on smart contract, uh, facilitates the overall process. And I understand that it can be done with the use of API as well. And harmonization of uh, those processes with the use of smart contracts and creation of environment uh, is done on a quicker basis and it is uh, unlike API, which is instance-related. Colleagues, we are run out of time and dear colleagues, I just have one question with brief answer from each of you. So we see interest on behalf of all the stakeholders, both governmental authorities and banks, in terms of the development of platforms and technologies, what is needed, one, two, or three points, what is needed for such huge number of pilot experiments become uh, real-life cases and used in real life? So <laughs> I just wanted to say one, two, three, law, law, law. Clive? Well, I think that... Uh we're at that stage at the moment when we will see this implementation of, of the technology occur. Uh, I think there are some really good parallels with blockchain and the beginnings of the internet. And I think at the moment that we're at that 1997, 1998 stage of the internet. And the internet in 1995 didn't look anything like the internet today. And I think that, uh, that, that you, you, we won't be able to force this. We won't be able to f you know, insist that people use blockchain. Blockchain will evolve. We're, we're very, as, as, a, as a group, technologists are quite impatient. We want it all now. Commercial blockchain post, post uh, Bitcoin is still only about three or four years old. And, you know, I, I, I meet people who say, when, and, when are these real applications going to go live? It's all hype, 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 and that's just nonsense. This is going to be a journey, and we're at the beginning of that journey. And I think that's, that, that it's really important that we get, get to understand that. Uh, blockchain is no longer hype. It's starting to be deployed. Some some um, applications that are to get deployed will fail because there either isn't a, a requirement for them or they're badly built. But over time, you know, we will have these applications. Some of them will be enormously successful. Some of them haven't even been, in, been thought up yet. But there's no going back. We're, we're there. So, yes, moving forward, that's your answer. Thank you. From the standpoint of state, I, as a person who uh, can't uh, do anything without law, uh, see the need for a regulatory sandbox, and also we need to be bold and brave enough to change. I would say that we lack successful cases in the market, except for our case, we have a couple of cases and no one still um, succeeded in producing this product. So I think we will keep going and use our example to show everyone that it really works and that uh, there is a huge potential for optimization of all the processes and interaction. So we're waiting for our heroes for the market, yes. 
I think that there is a need to move forward, as Clive has said, and when a real project is uh, existing, I think legislation will fit in uh, quite promptly. promptly. I think that it is not about technology, as it has been said in the morning, uh, because we need to cooperate and to negotiate in social spheres. And I do not believe in pilots that much. I believe in production. So if you have idea, you need to put it in production. If it's successful, great. If it's not, you just kill it and move forward. I can certainly say that. And there are three points uh, what need to be done. First and foremost, will, understanding what to do, and uh, no fear. If you're a clear professional with clear understanding of your business, of what you create and what are your goals from the standpoint of current legislation, then be bold enough to integrate it, to implement that, and show it to your regulator, or show the results, what the results are. And I'm sure that regulators are aimed at providing help to your business, at assistance, instead of hindering the process. So if uh, your solution is a w successful one, if you show uh, what you have done, it, if you also show the faults you have made, then uh, you will succeed. So will, desire, and lack of fear so in the virtual environment, you can deal with that for many years. And so uh, without that, you won't succeed and you won't get the result. Thank you very much. I think that all speakers, uh, today's speakers have will, have no fear, and have desire to work. I would like to thank you all, to thank all the participants. Thank you very much. And I'm sure that we have uh, succeeded in our discussion on how blockchain is working for business. And I hope that quite, sure, uh, quite um, soon we will touch blockchain.